Minnesota. I'm going to ask just a few questions um, briefly before we turn it over to the audience for questions. And, and I'd like to talk about, obviously, that last maybe 30 seconds or 45 seconds um, of the film. But before we touch on that, can, can we speak for just a minute about what motivated you to do this film? What, what was the spark that kind of started this off? Sure. Well, I mean, I've, I've always kind of had a fascination with the Lower East Side and, and history. Uh, you know, my, my family, my, my dad's family lived on Rivington Street two blocks down from the factory, you know, 100 years ago, basically. And, you know, and I grew up in New Jersey, but I, um, you know, I moved back to New York as soon as I could and ended up, you know, in the same neighborhood on Lower East Side. And, you know, I walked by and I, I'd known of Stripes, but I didn't know that they were in the neighborhood. And I walked by the factory for years. Um, you know, not realizing what I was passing until one day I just happened to stop, uh, you know, in front of the, the gate where the, where the, um, where the matzah comes out of the oven, almost on the sidewalk. And, um, and, you know, because this happens all the time, apparently, you know, one of the workers just pulled a hot matzah out from the oven, tossed it over his shoulder to me out the window. And, uh, you know, didn't even, then I guess turned around and saw that I kind of had a look of astonishment on my face and uh, invited me in to just, you know, take a look. Um, and you walk in and it's like, you know, it's what you said, it's like walking into 1930s New York City, you know, um, and there's, you know, this, the gears and machinery and the buzz of workers and the rabbis cleaning this whole, this, this whole thing that I didn't know what the story was there, but there was clearly a story. Um, and, uh, you know, it was something that I, you know, thought about for several years. This was six years ago at this point. Um, and then two and a half years ago, I ended up meeting Michael Green. Um, and uh, who's worked in food and drink his entire life and, you know, is interested in doing something in film and, and told me the idea. And, um, you know, we just immediately connected over this, this project. And uh, so with his, you know, tireless uh, advocacy of, of, of the work, and it's, it's uh, you know, that's how it came together. We started shooting about two years ago and, and uh, here we are now, so it's... Terrific, yeah. terrific. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, so, Phil, uh, Give us a, an idea of, of the production, of what goes through those factories every year as far as your supplying and, and demand in, in the community. Well, originally, it was set up really just as a, a need-based business. I mean, you were in the Lower East Side, bustling amounts of Jews everywhere, um, but it's really now become a national distribution. I mean, we're in everywhere from California, New York, Florida, Chicago, everywhere you can think of. Um, in terms of the production, though, yeah, look, at 40 versus 20, I'm moving slower, so are the machines. And it's amazing how now we used to actually shut down really for the summer, take everything apart, redo everything. Um, now we have to produce all year just to produce the same amount of matzah. Wow. And it's only getting worse, which is one of the reasons um, and one of the things that we had to consider when do we close down or, or move. Um, what people have to understand is that this was not a decision that was, hey, do we want to make $10 instead of $5? This was a decision, do we want to exist? This is a fifth generation family business, and we really want to see it become a sixth, seventh, eighth, God willing, tenth generation business. And it was a extremely tough decision um, you know, to, to ponder. Uh, everyone who works there truly is our family, and the new facility especially the people who have the most seniority will have every opportunity to maintain their jobs. And it, it sounds like this was a decision that has been talked about for 10 years for, I mean, this was not something that the right buyer came along. This was something that has been really wrestled with for a long time. Yeah, this was not, again, it wasn't an economic decision. It was a decision, it was a decision to survive. Um, yes, you know, we used to get every week some broker would come in or some person would walk by saying, hey, I want to buy your building, I want to buy this, I want to do this. Hey, we want to code develop, we want to do something like that. And we're like, nope, we're Moss Bakers, we're not real estate developers. And that's what we want to do and that's what we want to maintain. But at one point, if you're not going to be able to operate, you have to make a decision. And sometimes those decisions are extremely tough. I mean, you can tell my brother and my cousin, everyone when they're sitting there talking about it, they're, they get serious, you know? I mean, it's a, it's a tough thing. These people are truly part of our family. Uh, Zapata 
Anthony, the guy you saw, a pretty funny guy. Um, you know, my brother always says, yeah, he always has a job. He's the one who ran in with the garden hose. You know, and it's true, it's crazy. However, um, my parents passed away when we were younger at different times. Anthony was there helping us bury our family. So it really, it, it's a very um, deep emotional attachment to this and it's not a decision that was ever made lightly. And if anything, economically, it should have been done 20 years ago because it was really about money. I mean, between not having loading docks, having to pay, you know, additional for whether it's labor, uh, you know, every other thing that's brought in, whether it's flour, any, anything that we do in Manhattan, we're actually paying a surcharge for often. Um, and because of that, it was never about eking out more of a profit, it was about staying as long as you could stay. And even union-wise, um, people don't realize, like when Hostess goes out, there's a, you know, a baker's union that we're involved with. Other companies have to take up the slack from the other post-employment benefit obligations that exist. So a little company like Strites has to take up some of the part of Hostess, which doesn't really make a ton of sense, but it's part of reality. Um, one of the things that I was I was really struck by as I was looking at the film was how much of the production was done by hand, and it, it, this is really for for the Michaels. But as you were exploring this story further, what were the things that kind of surprised you or struck you in this story, aside from the unusual timing? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess. Just I've, I've never been in a place, in a workplace or any place at all, I guess, where, where as you were talking about this, this just feeling of family. The minute you walk into this place, there's just something about it. And the more, uh, you know, I got to, to, to learn and, and speak with the family and with the workers, it's just the, the more you come to understand that it really, there's a feeling of like being in this together. And there's, you know, I mean, so, I mean, this is, this is a, a difficult time right now for, the family and, and the workers, but it's, you know, all of this is kind of a, you know, I don't know, there's there's a, a sense of just everybody being in it together, which is, I don't know, it's kind of amazing, amazing to see. Um, I don't know, and just the stories of the workers and where they've come from, um, you know, I mean, Anthony talked about how he put his kids through college working, you know, at the factory, and there's just so many, so many stories like that, you know, guys uh, came from uh, Uzbekistan, um, I think there's, there's seven of them, uh, one of them, you know, talking about <clears throat> how growing up he had to, you know, they, his family made matzah in a windowless room and build a house, and they, you know, they weren't able to do it there. And now he, you know, came here and he's, you know, he's working at a matzah factory and, you know, um, doing it's just, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. It's great. It's great. And really, generations, I gotta tell you, work there, but it's almost like going to Disneyland away with your family. When something breaks down, it becomes Adventureland. When it's uh, you know sometimes it's fantasy land. It's it, it's it's everything behind every other every other door and every other window. But I really have to say that the Michaels, plural, did an unbelievable job. It's it's got to be incredibly difficult. I couldn't do it myself in terms of not just telling a family's history, but the history of a community on the Lower East Side and of how you produce something for a number of years. So you guys really did a great job. Phil, thank you. And I, I just want to um, echo something that uh, that Phil said, and I know Michael and I feel when we heard about the decision to move, it was very emotional. It was emotional for us as filmmakers, and several people have asked Michael, "Well, did it influence the story? You know, was you did you go back to the editing room and?" We didn't make many changes because we still think the story is is real and it's authentic and it's about a story about resilience and, and staying as long as possible. And the wonderful thing, and I'd love Michael for you to say more, is that um, this was a very tough decision for the family, very tough and very, very emotional. Um, but what is refreshing is that uh, the strikes family is going to continue and the brand is still going to be based on being authentic. Do we have questions from the audience? Great. Uh, 
Hi. Um, I have a I have a broad question about uh, what affected the decision. Um, it seems to me that all these initiatives coming from Mayor Bloomberg prior to de Blasio taking over and Governor Cuomo were uh, uh, subsidizing and stimulating all these various industries, uh, tech, wanting to make New York City a tech hub and so on and so forth. Why wouldn't New York want to preserve the little trickle of manufacturing that still exists there with those kinds of initiatives. I just don't understand what's going on. Yeah, um, you know, uh, that's something, because I mean, this is certainly not the only, I mean, this is, it's the story that I'm most connected to, but there are a lot of stories of, of family businesses that are going through very similar things and, you know, having to make very similar difficult decisions, and um, and it is it is unfortunate that uh, you know I don't know I think it's, in Stride situation it's it's a little different because it's it's also dealing with overseas competition things like that as opposed to a retail shop in the neighborhood and there are so many of those that have been lost as well um, I don't know I wish there were more protections in place in, in these kinds of situations for. For family businesses, sort of like their, historic landmarks yeah, for businesses, you know, yeah, that are that are really an asset to the community, um, you know, more so than whatever will replace them. I completely agree, and I think uh, it's something that, that needs to be done. I can tell you that. I mean, no, please go. Like every year, you call up. I don't know. You, you do it with your homes, or you do it with a business. You call up, you're trying to get a tax payment. Every year, they're like, nope, sorry, can't do anything. Like, look. The thing's not going up in value. Look, we can't move back, we can't move to the side. Business is getting worse, not better. We should have a tax payment. Nope. I gotta tell you about it. a month ago, three weeks ago after it was announced, the city calls up, hey, we'll give you a tax payment now if you stay. No. See, like, where were you? Every other year. Like, it, it, it's incredible sometimes, you know, what forces someone to do something, but if you look at what goes on nationally and internationally with respect to where production is really being done. So in New York and New Jersey, you have us and you have Manischewitz. And then there's really just the, Europe, I'm sorry, the Israeli production that comes in. But the Israeli matzah comes in at such a lower price that when companies now who are self-distributing like some of the larger supermarkets who are gonna give stuff away for free, if I'm gonna give something away, I'm gonna give, what's, I'm gonna give away what's gonna cost me less to do. And I really wish people understood, like when you're buying a product, whether you're wearing you know, polo, whatever you're wearing, you're wearing and you're, you're standing behind what that company really is. The values, the morals, and for an extra 30 cents or 40 cents, I promise you, we're not going home richer. You know, it's, it's trying to keep everything afloat. And at one point, when you start running negative, it, it runs into an issue. Thank you for the question. My question is for Manischewitz. I mean, not, not Manischewitz. Oh, not Manischewitz. It's a product, a product question. You just said Manischewitz. No. But it is for you as a product. And would you please do me a big, big favor? One of your competitors used to make a Kanish mix. And that took care of keeping all the kids quiet while I was getting everything ready to get the table started for Seder. They don't make it anymore. No, but you have chocolate covered matzah. It's They'll love it. Yeah. Oh, we can't do chocolate. Those other mamas won't let you do that. But if y'all, somebody, please, y'all pick up this condition mix, make it, get it in there. I'll buy 10 packages a year, I promise. And all my friends will. Because this is how we kept all the kids quiet. So now it's the Bubby. I need something to keep the kids quiet. Please, pick it up. New products, that's what we mamas want. I'll definitely talk to the rest of my family about that, but we do have candy. We have other things that you could... Uh easily try and help your grandchildren with, but I'll definitely talk about new products for you. Thank you, thank you. Hi, I was wondering, since y'all talked about how great the water was in New York, if you're gonna be able to get that in New Jersey when you move, and also would there be other changes? Are you gonna try and keep all the machinery very similar to what you had to make it the same matzah? So right now there's a 70 foot, 70, excuse me, 72 foot oven. Actually, there's two of them, one on the third floor, one on the first floor. Um, in today's day and age, you really would want a longer oven. You could get more through at one time. Um, so would the ovens be exactly the same? No, they'll probably be a little wider, a little bit longer. 
Um, we're gonna try and keep it the same way though with respect to like a confection type oven, so you don't have the direct heat, because you wanna produce the same product, which is one of the things when we made the decision, like there's three things, there's people, product, and process. So we have the product, we know it works. We have the people, we just gotta help change a little bit of the process based on what's going on in the economy today and in the Lower East Side. So we're gonna try, we've been told by all the different engineers we've brought in that we can recreate it. Um, from the water aspect, um, I don't know if any of you have ever had Brooklyn water bagels. You know, what it is, it's just a reverse osmosis in the water. And so we'll do that same system and be able to recreate the New York City water. Hopefully. I'm really interested about the seasonality of matzah in terms of you're trying to manufacture all year round, but the demand must be really heightened at one time of the year and how that impacts, you know, warehousing and storage and, and just the whole process. It really, it really uh, I guess, affects more what, you put, what you're manufacturing at what time in terms of like your manufacturing schedules. Um, it really is like a 60-40 split, but you know, when I talk to my children and I say, hey, you know what, right now, if someone says, hey, where do you want to go for dinner Monday night? And say, oh, let's go for Italian, or let's go for Chinese, or whatever it is. No one says, let's go for Jewish, <laughs> all right? So I tell my kids, I'm like, whether you're in the matzo business or you're not, make one of the things that you want to do in your future, make Jewish, you know, cool again. Make it so it's not just on Passover. Because I gotta tell you, if you took the, the pink, I don't know, whichever one you want to talk about, whether it's the pink box, brown box, whichever one you talk about, if you took that wrapper off, the product is good. I swear to you, not because of Schreitz or that I can get it for whatever. Um, I eat it every day. Five in the morning, I'm on the computer, I have that and peanut butter. No, it really, I gotta tell you, it used to be a, a huge disparity between the two. And I'd say in the last 20 years, it's really like a 60-40 split between Passover and non-Passover production. I really like what you said. I, I love this idea of being Jewish outside just the high holy days. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. Don't no, hear Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you for being here. I was wondering if any of your employees had any retirement packages, especially those who would not be going with you to New Jersey. Um, the employees do have, you know, four hundred and one ks and things like that. If you're asking if there have been any like early retirement buyouts or anything like that, no, there hasn't been any situations like that. People um, still haven't decided who wants to come and who doesn't want to come um, at a later date. Then I'm sure something like that would follow, but to date. Yeah, you know, it's too early, I think, in the process. You call people? Should I call on someone? You want to call on someone? Well, there, um, there's microphones running about. I've got people up here. All right, well, yeah, okay. scream it out. I feel crazy. I'm gonna cry, I can tell you that. Um, I will cry, you know, I'm, I'm sensitive. But uh, it, it's a tough thing when, like my brother and I, we would go down there on the, that, like on those Sunday mornings during um, the Passover season and help the people. And I think people, customers, they like that interaction. They like seeing that, hey, this family was still involved and, and everything was still good that way. That being said, um, I don't think we, we don't have anything planned yet. Um, there's obviously, because it's a factory, it's not like, all right, shut the door and leave. You have to break machinery down. Um, you know, maybe some stuff will be donated to different, you know, tenement building, different things down there. Um, but not the ovens, I mean, things like that. The only way you get that stuff out of there is with a sledgehammer. So it's, uh, it's, it's a tough thing. Yeah. One more question. I think we go, I'm good.
Um, we actually, we have screenings coming up in New York uh, it, towards the end of March, leading up to Passover. Um, we're gonna be at the, the JCC Manhattan. Um, they have a beautiful like 250 seat theater. We'll be there for four dates uh, at the end of March. We'll be uh, And if you make it to New York or the premieres in fourth Florida markets, there's free boxes of strikes matzah for anyone who comes. Don't worry, Bill, you're gonna get the bill. Would it be kosher if women worked there? There were no women in the movie who worked there. There are there are women who work in the factory. Um, but all on the production line? Not on the production line. Um, one of the things that I think it was maybe one of the earlier cuts that I had seen. Everyone from the mixing room, you know, to when it's being mixed to actually when it comes out. All those people are Shomer Shabbos, who everyone is touching the actual product yeah. before it comes out of the oven. Women are Shomer Shabbos? No, I mean, why not? You can say, I mean, I'll give someone a job. Well, I don't know now, but uh, I, got, I got a line of people who have to who have to go first. But there have been there have been women. Any kind of legal problem? No. You get a religious exemption? I'm sorry. No, it's um, it was never done because someone's a man or someone's a woman. Um, it's just who's applied, and the people who applied have been men for the most part who worked within the factory. Um, the person who was running the store before, uh, there were two women who ran the store. Um, there's there was another one in the county and another one there's in uh, in the facility, and in the we have another place in Munaki where uh, actually a woman is working. So. It, it has nothing to do with a chauvinistic kind of approach or anything like that. Um, anyone is, is open to try and get a job anywhere. Great. At this point, I have to actually end our, our program as we're getting the, right, the next film into this uh, auditorium. Please help me to thank uh, Michael Green, Michael Levine, and Phil Yugoda. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much.